So thank you all for being here. Um, as Dr. Gavota said, my name is Dan Gillespie. Um, my, the rest of my committee is made up of Dr. Sally Miller and Dr. Jones. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting my exit seminar, uh, which is the effects of low nutrient solution pH on hydroponic leafy green plant growth, nutrient concentration, and pythium filospore infection. So I'm just going to begin with a brief background and introduction before moving into our pH studies, our pythium challenge studies, and then end with some conclusions and key takeaways of this work. So what my research focuses on is controlled environment agriculture, or CEA. So what that is is an intensive form of hydroponically based agriculture, which aims to maximize yields and minimize inputs in space. Um, so hydroponics can be defined as the growing of plants without soil in a complete mineral nutrient solution. Hydroponic systems may be employed with a substrate or an aggregate term substrate or aggregate culture. This is typically how fruiting crops like tomatoes and leafy or tomatoes and strawberries are grown. Excuse me. Um, so in that case, there's just some type of substrate like a cocoa core or peat being used for the nutrient solution is provided to that substrate and the plants grow in the substrate. However, most leafy greens are grown in liquid and water culture hydroponic systems where the roots grow directly into the nutrient solution, which is how we conducted my research and what this presentation will focus on today. So liquid and water culture hydroponics. So we chose to use basil and spinach as our crop species or as our model species for this work because of the crops of the leafy greens grown hydroponically, basil and spinach seem to be most susceptible to pythium infection. So basil is a widely cultivated warm season annual crop. Most basil in the United States is grown in open field production systems and it may be grown for the fresh market, the processed market or used for essential oils. However, almost all basil grown in controlled environments or grown hydroponically is produced for the fresh market. In the United States, there's a very no, uh, limited number of registered herbicides and pesticides approved for use on growing basil, and fresh market basil must be free of residue. And since there's such a limited number of herbicides and pesticides, there's a large amount of labor devoted towards weed control and open field basil production. And this is an increasingly uh, popular crop here. So we see, we've seen a 96% increase in acres of fresh cut herbs harvested from 2012 to 2017. Uh, so the USDA does not uh, track basil statistics individually, so I'm using this fresh herbs category to kind of represent basil production in the United States. Um, but of the basil that is grown under protection, so basil that may be grown in a greenhouse or high tunnel type systems, some type of protect protection, only 21% of that is grown hydroponically. So a spinach, spinach is a climate sensitive cool season crop, similar to basil, nearly all spinach in the United States is grown in open field production systems. And this may be grown for the fresh market or the frozen market. Similar to basil, we've seen an increase in acres harvested. So there's been a 51% increase in spinach acres harvested from 2012 to 2017. And what I mainly attribute this to, or what I hypothesize this increase being attributed to, is the increased demand for clean, pre-washed baby leaf spinach has become increasingly popular in recent years. So similar to basil, spinach production is fairly labor intensive with the majority of the labor being devoted towards weed management and harvesting basil. So again, we see weed management coming up. So although there are more herbicides registered for use on growing spinach, when people are growing this baby leaf spinach, it's a very quick cropping cycle. So the timing of application does become tricky and difficult because uh, with a lot of chemical control options, it must be, there's a post-harvest interval. So with such a quick cropping cycle, the timing of chemical control options becomes tricky. So again, there's a lot of labor devoted towards weed management here. We'll see shortly that most spinach is grown in fairly arid climates of the United States. And most of this is always uh, produced under irrigated production systems. So it becomes a very water intensive open field sort of production. And there's a very, now there's a very strong demand for locally grown hydroponic systems. However, most controlled environment agricultural operations are avoiding this crop due to its susceptibility to pythium. So there's very few uh, hydroponic operations that are successfully growing this crop with the absence of pythium. So here, this is just a map showing the distribution of basil and spinach production in the United States. And what we can see here is that it's a very consolidated production and mainly dominated by four or five states here. So we see that 93% of spinach is grown in California, Arizona, Texas, and New Jersey, and 82% of the fresh herbs grown in California, New Jersey, Florida, and New York. So basically these crops are grown in these, uh, these four or five states, and then they're gonna be transported to consumers all throughout the country. 
This transportation is largely associated with food waste due to the highly perishable nature of these leafy greens. It also degrades the nutritional quality the longer it's transported, and there's also large amounts of greenhouse gas associated with the transportation of these crops. So why do we want to grow these crops in controlled environments? So as we just saw from the previous map, uh, open field basil and spinach production is really limited to just a couple states, so it's a very centralized form of production. In controlled environments, we are allowed to produce these crops in environments that would otherwise not be suitable for production, so it allows for much more distributed, much more localized production. These uh, crops can be grown closer to the point of consumption, closer to urban areas, so a much more localized form of production. We also see with the exception of California that mainly uh, these crops can only be grown at certain times of the year in most of these states. So it's a very limited production window. Again, in controlled environments, you're controlling the environment and not exposed to the uh, outdoor environment. So it allows for year round production. I mentioned that there's very labor intensive form of open field basil and spinach production with the majority of this labor being devoted towards wheat management. In controlled environments and hydroponics, you eliminate the need for weed control. You can also make these hydroponic systems waste high, waste high uh, which is much more ergonomic and much more comfortable for laborers. I mentioned there's very few pesticides approved and the difficulty or the timing uh, of pesticide application or chemical control application can be difficult with these crops. Um, in controlled environments, you can greatly increase the efficacy of biocontrol. So releasing a beneficial insect in a controlled environment is uh, much more effective as it's contained within that environment, as opposed to releasing a beneficial insect in the open field where it's not contained by any type of structure or any type of uh, enclosure. So you can really decrease the reliancy uh, uh, and the need of chemical control in controlled environments because you uh, increase the efficacy of biocontrol. And in recent years, we've seen more and more uh, of uh, human pathogens or cases of E. coli uh, being linked to leafy greens grown in open fields. So in open fields, you're exposed to birds that may be, may be flying overhead, the application of manure fertilizers. So there's been more and more human pathogen links to leafy greens grown in the open field. So in controlled environments, you're not exposed to birds that may be flying overhead, the manure, uh, application of manure fertilizer. You can also sanitize and really sterilize your growing equipment and growing environment. Decrease the, uh, the threat of human pathogens contaminating uh, your produce. So although we are, are growing in controlled environments, which can greatly reduce the threat of soil-borne diseases, we are still exposed to these soil-borne diseases as they can be introduced to greenhouses and controlled environment uh, operations. And one of the most common uh, pathogens or diseases experienced in hydroponic crop production is pythium. So pythium is an OMIC pathogen that inflect, infects plant roots, causing damping off, root damage, stem rot, and reduced yields. So pythium can reproduce both sexually and asexually. The result of sexual reproduction is a thick wall resting spore, the old spore, and this is typically what establishes a pythium infection. Or this, so basically a pythium infection is mostly uh, initiated by the old spore. The old spore may be lying dormant on greenhouse structure, uh, so it can really, it's, it's the resting spore. Um, and once an epithium infection is established by an oospore, epithium will begin to produce very large numbers of the asexual zoospore. So the zoospore is the primary dispersal propagule of epithium. So whereas the oospore will uh, typically initiate the infection, the oospore is what disperses and spreads the, the, the infection to neighboring plants and throughout the hydroponic systems. And the zoospore does not contain a cell wall as opposed to the oospore, which does have a thick cell wall. So pythium may be introduced through the air, sand, soil, or peat substrates, source water, or insects, laborers from the greenhouse to bring it in on their shoes. Uh, there are many different sources of contamination, but uh, these are the most common listed here. But once a pythium infection is established in the hydroponic system, we tend to see the dispersal is quite rapid due to consistent environmental conditions and the uniform genetic host in, in uh, hydroponic systems. There are very few chemical control options for root disease in general, and even, few, even fewer of these uh, chemical control options are registered for use in greenhouses and indoor environments. However, low pHs below 5.0 have been shown to negatively affect the asexual zoospores motility, uh, the duration of the motility, as well as the production of the zoospore has been shown to be suppressed at pHs below 5.0. However, we typically grow crops hydroponically in a pH range of 5.5 to 6.5. As we start to move outside of this 5.5 to 6.5, we tend to see growth inhibitions and nutrient disorders begin to occur in the plants. 
And this is due to the, the pH of the plant root environment being one of the most important factors affecting plant growth because pH uh, really can cause a great impact on nutrient availability, ion antagonism, the ionic species present, and the solubility of fertilizer salts. So because pH affects all of these things like nutrient uptake and nutrient availability so much, it becomes difficult to determine if growth inhibitions outside of the 5.5 to 6.5 range are due to the direct effect of acidity or alkalinity, or is it pH dependent factors that are affecting nutrient uptake and nutrient availability, which in turn are inhibiting plant growth. So to reiterate there, it becomes difficult to say it's the acidity or alkalinity that's inhibiting plant growth, or it's the pH dependent factors that are affecting nutrient availability, which in turn are inhibiting plant growth. However, as long as the extreme ends of acidity and alkalinity are avoided, you can typically attribute these growth inhibitions to pH dependent factors that are affecting nutrient availability. And there's been work that's shown that these may, uh, the, the, the growth inhibitions outside of this 5.5 to 6.5 range may be mitigated if certain precautionary uh, measures are taken to account for these pH dependent factors that are affecting nutrient availability and nutrient uptake. So what we hypothesize is that if precautionary measures are taken to account for pH dependent factors affecting nutrient availability, crops can be grown in low pH without plant growth inhibitions where the growth and reproduction of pithio may be suppressed. So this was really uh, kind of broken into two phases here. So the first year is what we uh, focused on was our pH studies. Um, and this is where we looked at how pH was affecting basal and spinach plant growth. So the objective here was to determine if adjusting micronutrient concentrations in the nutrient solution based on the reported availability levels is effective in mitigating growth inhibitions observed in lower than conventional pH. And then we also wanted to look at it, or to examine the influence that pH has on basal and spinach plant growth and the influence pH has on nutrient concentration of the leaf tissue. But basically the question we were trying to answer with this first phase here was what pH and can basil and spinach be grown in without significant reductions in plant growth? The second part of this was our Pythium Challenge study, where it was taking what we've learned from these pH studies and actually applying it to this study to determine if low pH can reduce Pythium disease incidence and severity. So focusing on our basil and spinach pH studies now. So the way we went about these studies is we utilized a randomized complete block design where basil was grown in a greenhouse and spinach was grown in a growth chamber. Uh, the reason for this difference was we did not have access to a growth chamber at the start of this project. So we worked with the greenhouse space that we had. And once the growth chamber we became available, we moved the project down to there just to allow for more environmental uniformity, greater experimental control. We employed a four by two factorial treatment structure with their pH treatments being 4.0, 4.5, 5.0 and 5.5. And we applied two nutrient solutions to each of these pH levels. Our standard nutrient solution that we typically use to grow our leafy green crops and an adjusted nutrient solution where we adjusted the micronutrient concentration based on these pH reference charts. So if we look at this pH reference chart here, we see that the micronutrients manganese, boron, zinc, and copper become highly available at the low pH levels being tested. So we decreased their concentration by 50% in the nutrient solution and attempts to avoid toxicities. On, alternatively, we see that molybdenum uh, becomes very restricted at the low pH levels being tested. So we increase the concentration of molybdenum by 200% and attempts to avoid molybdenum deficiency. So the reason we chose to just uh, kind of set a baseline with these micronutrients. We did not want to adjust macronutrient concentrations at the start of this experiment because we just wanted to ask the question, does adjusting nutrient concentrations, uh, is that an effective strategy? Um, in addition, when you adjust macronutrient concentrations, you have to take into account the ratios of each nutrient to each other. Um, so that was something we didn't want to play with at the start of this experiment. Um, so for example, if we adjusted the concentration of calcium, we also have to take into account the concentration of magnesium or the ratio of magnesium to calcium. So we just wanted to set a baseline with these micronutrients with the thought uh, being that we could come back and adjust the macronutrients at a later point in time if we uh, learn from these, these micronutrient adjustments that maybe a macronutrient adjustment would be effective. So just again to reiterate, set the baseline with these micronutrients if we did not want to adjust the, the concentrations or the ratios of the macronutrients. So we grew two basal cultivars, a cultivar uh, called Dolce Fresca and then a cultivar Nufar and just one spinach cultivar which was uh, Corvair. 
So when we evaluated this is we looked at plant growth responses, a fresh and dry root and shoot mass, the number of leaves per plant and the height for basal plants. We also looked at the nutrient concentration of leaf tissue to try and give us an idea of how pH was uh, affecting nutrient uptake. And we played a two-way ANOVA with the two key HSD mean separation. We also performed a regression analysis to investigate the pH or investigate the effect that pH was having on plant growth and nutrient uptake. And our experimental unit here was our hydroponic system and our sampling unit being individual plants. So when we look at basal, basal plant growth results, what we found with basil was quite surprising. We found that basil grew equally well in a pH of 4.0 to 4.5, even though the nutrient concentration of the leaf tissue, of most elements, decreased with decreasing pH. So we saw no significant differences across our pH levels, and we also saw that the nutrient adjustment did not affect plant growth. So this was very surprising as we did not expect basil to grow so well at such a low pH. But we can see from these pictures here that the, uh, the, the very, look very similar and we can also uh, want to take it or to make note that we did not experience or observe any nutrient disorders in any of our pH or nutrient solution treatments. So the nutrient solution did not affect plant growth nor did it seem necessary to avoid nutrient disorders. So and here's just a graphical representation of that. So at the top, we're looking at our uh, fresh leaf mass of basil and the bottom is the fresh root mass. And then on the x-axis, we have our pH nutrient solution treatments, where the number indicates the pH level and A is either adjusted nutrient solution or S is standard nutrient solution. And again, as I just explained, we saw no significant differences here across our treatments. So this was quite surprising. Uh, with spinach, however, we saw a much different trend. So now we're looking at spinach shoot mass. So both the fresh and the dry shoot mass where pH is on the x-axis here. And with shoot mass, we see a linear decrease in shoot mass as pH decreases with significant reductions at pH is below 5.0. So much different response with spinach as opposed to basil. If we look at the spinach root mass, we see it also decreased with decreasing pH. However, it's nonlinear was actually maximized at a pH of 5.0 here. Um, so again, we're looking at pH on the x-axis and then fresh and dry uh, root mass of spinach. Um, and again, we see it, uh, it not as sharply decreasing as the shoot mass did, but again, we see it basically decreasing with pH. So if we look at spinach, uh, kind of the visual representation of this here, um, we, if we look at a pH of 4.0, we see that the spinach growth is very inhibited. Spinach barely grew at all at this pH level. Um, and if we take a close look at the roots here, they seem to be uh, suffering from hydrogen ion toxicity. They're really kind of burnt and stunted. Um, they seem to really avoid the nutrient solution, kind of form a, a root ball around the rock wool or the plug of the plant. Um, so they really seem to avoid the nutrient solution at a pH of 4.0. So what this indicates to me is that at a pH of 4.0, it was the direct effect of acidity that was inhibiting spinach plant growth. However, if we look at a pH of 4.5, we see pretty typical plant growth. It, it looks to be normal plant growth. We see nice white long roots growing fine into the nutrient solution, normal shoot growth. It is reduced compared to the other pH levels, but it, it's displaying normal uh, morphology and normal plant growth. So what, this, what this indicates to me is that the direct effect was not inhibiting spinach plant growth at a pH of 4.5, but rather it was pH dependent factors that were negatively affecting nutrient availability and nutrient uptake which in turn inhibited the plant growth at pH 4.5. So where it seems to be at 4.0, the acidity is what inhibited plant growth. It seems to be uh, the decrease in nutrient uptake or nutrient availability that was inhibiting spinach plant growth at 4.5. And if we look at the nutrient concentration of the leaf tissue, we do see that pH had a very large effect on the nutrient concentration of the nutrient uptake. So here we're looking at just three nutrients. So we're looking at magnesium on the top here, manganese and zinc on the bottom. And we have both basil and spinach plotted on the same graphs here, whereas basil is represented by a blue circle and spinach represented by the orange triangle. So I'm, as again, I'm just showing a couple nutrients here, but I do wanna make note that almost all the nutrients, especially the cation nutrients, showed this similar trend where, where there's a linear decrease as pH decreased. So that's the point I'm trying to make with this slide is we saw a linear decrease in nutrient concentration of the leaf tissue as pH decreased. And the second point I wanna make with this slide is if we look at the bottom here, we see manganese and zinc. And we see again of the linear decreases, pH decreases. However, if we think back to that pH reference chart and our new adjusted nutrient solution, we expected to see the opposite of what we actually observe here. 
So we anticipated to see toxicities of nutrients like manganese and zinc at the low pH level. But as we see here, we see basically the complete opposite of that. And we see decre it decreasing as pH decreased. So we, to explain this, we thought about how these pH reference charts are developed. And we learned that most of these pH reference charts are developed based on soil or substrate pH dependent factors that are affecting nutrient uptake and nutrient availability. So in soil and substrate, you have the presence of these negatively charged colloids that are going to attract positively charged cations, in this example, manganese and zinc. As we decrease the pH, we're increasing the concentration of hydrogen ions. And as we increase the concentration of hydrogen ions, these hydrogen ions are going to increasingly exchange with these positively charged cations, making them dislodge from the, uh, the colloids into the soil solution, making them very readily available to the plant, which is why you do see toxicities of these nutrients or increased uptake at the low pH levels in soil or substrate-based systems. However, if you remember, we were growing in liquid water culture systems. In liquid and water culture systems, the presence of negatively charged colloids are not there. So there are no negatively charged colloids in liquid culture hydroponic systems. However, there is the presence of negatively charged plant roots. So here we see at a pH 5, 5 to 6, 5, nutrient uptake seems to be optimized at this pH range, right? We know that. So we're decreasing the pH here. Again, we're increasing the concentration of hydrogen ions. As we're increasing the concentration of hydrogen ions, there's gonna be more and more hydrogen ions that are gonna occupy binding sites or uptake channels on the plant roots. And what that's going to do is going to basically compete with these cation nutrients for binding sites on the plant roots and for uptake for the plant roots. So as we decrease the pH, the hydrogen ions are increasingly inhibiting cation nutrient uptake, which is why I think we saw uh, the decreased concentration of the leaf tissue of, of nutrients that we expected to see increase at the low pH. So the, the, the basically the pH dependent factors that are affecting nutrient uptake and nutrient availability in liquid culture hydroponic systems are much different than those affecting substrate and soil where those reference charts are typically based off of. And just to kind of reiterate that, so the hydronium ion concentration, as we know, pH is a log scale, so it does greatly increase uh, with, with a fairly small decrease in pH. So at a pH of 4.0, the hydronium ion concentration is 31.6 times greater than that at pH 5.5. And at a pH of 4.0 and 4.5, the hydronium ion concentration exceeded the concentration of all the cation nutrients except for potassium, calcium, and magnesium. So it exceeded the concentration of all those micronutrients that we adjusted and all the nutrients except for those three. So what we tried to do to kind of develop a better way at looking at nutrient availability in liquid culture hydroponic systems was develop a nutrient availability chart that was based on pH dependent factors for liquid culture hydroponic systems instead of a soil or substrate type system. So here we developed these basal and spinach nutrient availability charts based on the nutrient concentration of the leaf tissue, uh, uh, varying pH relative to the concentration of the plants grown at a pH of 5.5. So we could think of this bar at a 5.5, it's basically 100% nutrient concentration, and then all the lower pHs are relative to that at 5.5. So we hope this does here, or we hope we can uh, uh, apply this chart, is, is much more applicable for liquid culture-based hydroponic systems. So again, it, this chart, our hope is that it gives a much better indication of how nutrient availability and nutrient uptake is affected in liquid culture, as opposed to using these charts that are developed in a substrate or soil and using those charts for liquid culture, which is typically done. So that is kind of our hope here is that this is a better representation of nutrient availability in liquid culture. So just to end with a discussion here is, is why do we see that basil was able to tolerate continuous exposure to low pH where spinach growth was so sensitive? And what I hypothesize this had to do with is basil's seemingly low nutrient requirement. So if we think back, I mentioned that the nutrient concentration of the leaf tissue for both species, both basil and spinach, uh, basically decreased with decreasing pH. However, with basil, this did not affect plant growth, but with spinach, it did affect plant growth. So what I hypothesized is that basil just has such a low nutrient requirement that it was able to tolerate the reduction in nutrient uptake without uh, reductions in plant growth, whereas the reduction in nutrient uptake in spinach caused plant growth to be reduced. And this was further, further supported by another study that looked at uh, nutrient solution electrical conductivity or nutrient solution EC. 
on how that affects basal plant growth. So nutrient solution EC is basically uh, an indication of how much fertilizer is in a nutrient solution. And what this study found was that basal grew equally well in an EC of 0 0.5 to 4.0. So an EC of 0 0.5 is basically no fertilizer. It's almost tap water. Uh, there's a very small amount of fertilizer in there. So the fact that basal grew equally well in that EC indicates uh, that, that basal has a seemingly low nutrient requirement, which may explain why it was able to tolerate such a low pH without growth reductions. So we saw that spinach at pH of 4.5 uh, did show reductions in growth, but it did display normal plant growth. So what would be interesting to follow up on is this study is taking what we've learned and uh, that, that cation competition I showed a couple slides back and kind of reformulating a nutrient solution to determine if that would alleviate the growth reduction we saw in spinach at pH 4.5. So maybe developing a nutrient solution with increased concentrations of all the cation nutrients, would that allow these cation nutrients to outcompete the increased concentration of hydrogen ions and therefore allow spinach growth to be enhanced at pH 4.5? So that would just be an interesting thing to look at, is taking what we learned from this and then developing a reformulated nutrient solution. And then one last thing here is, was the nutrient adjustment effective? I did not present this data because the, the adjustment uh, made to the nutrient solution did not affect plant growth in basil or spinach. But I do wanna make note that it did not seem to be necessary in basil as we did not observe any nutrient disorders and did not seem to be effective in the case of spinach or uh, at least the nutrients that we adjusted were not effective. So we did see nutrient disorders with spinach grown in a pH of 4.0, but we did see this in both the standard and the adjusted nutrient solution, so it was not effective in that case. Uh, but nevertheless, the uh, nutrient solution adjustment had no effect on plant growth. So the standard nutrient solution and the adjusted nutrient solution, those plants show no significant differences between each other. So, to wrap up these pH study, just some key takeaways here. So we saw that basal growth was not significantly affected by pH 4.0 to 5.5, whereas spinach growth was reduced in pH is below 5.0. This is likely attributed to the species specific nutrient requirements and basal seemingly low nutrient requirements seems to be responsible for its tolerance to acidity. And we also learned that the pH dependent factors affecting nutrient uptake and nutrient availability in liquid culture are different than in that substrate and soil culture production systems. So with that, we learned that basil could grow at a pH as low as 4.0 without reductions in growth. So the next step was to perform this Pythium Challenge study. So the Pythium Challenge study, our hypothesis here was that low pH of 4.0 will negatively affect pythium zoospore chemotaxis and duration of zoospore motility. Thus, basal grown in pH of 4.0 will display decreased disease incidence and severity. So our objective here was to determine if low pH can reduce pythium asanagematrum disease incidence and severity after zoospore inoculation. So this study was conducted in a growth chamber growing basal cultivar NUFAR. From our previous study, we just chose the one cultivar that grew the fastest. We utilized a randomized complete block design again with eight replications per treatment, a two by two factorial treatment structure with our low pH treatment of 4.0 and our high pH treatment where it was maintained in a conventional pH range of 5.5 to 6.5. And we had both an inoc inoculated nutrient solution and a non-inoculated nutrient solution at each pH level. The nutrient solution was inoculated with pythium asanagematrum, zoospores five days subsequent to transplant at a concentration of 3.13 times 10 to the third zoospores per milliliter. After 19 days of growth or 14 days after inoculation, we harvested the plants for evaluation and analysis. So the evaluation and analysis is very similar to our pH studies with the addition of a root disease rating. This was a scale of zero to 10 uh, with each 1.0 increment representing a 10% increase in uh, disease symptomology. So a score of zero indicated no disease symptomology present. A score of one would be 10% of the roots are brown, damaged, discolored. A score of two, 20%, and so on. Uh, whereas a score of 10 would indicate 100% of the roots are damaged or more or less a dead plant. Again, we looked at our plant growth responses, depression dry, leaf, stem, root mass, plant height and root length, and then a two-way ANOVA with a two-key HSD uh, was employed where our experimental unit was our hydroponic systems and then sampling unit, our individual plants here. 
right, so what we found with this study was quite exciting. We were very happy uh, on these results. Um, so we, we found that disease symptomology was almost exclusively limited to our pH 5.5 inoculated treatment. And we saw almost no disease symptomology in our pH 4.0 inoculated treatment. So we see with the disease rating, this is significantly higher. But the main thing here is that we saw almost no disease in any of the treatments except for the high pH inoculated treatment. So not only did we see increased disease symptomology in this treatment, we also see reduced redu or reduction in plant growth responses in this pH 5.5 inoculated treatment. So here we're looking at fresh leaf mass and we're here uh, we have our treatments on the x-axis here. And we can see that fresh leaf mass is significantly reduced in our pH 5.5 inoculated treatment as compared to all the other treatments. Oops. If we look at stem mass, we see a very similar trend or the exact trend. Uh, so again, the same thing here, uh, treatments on the x-axis, but now we're looking at the stem mass and we see that it was significantly reduced in pH 5.5 inoculated treatment. Um, visually, when I was collecting this data, I did not expect to see reductions in the leaf growth. The, the leaves looked the same, but I, I, when I was collecting this data and handling this plants, the, the stem mask was, I could, I could feel it in this 5.5 inoculated treatment. It was much thinner and much weaker in this pH 5.5 inoculated treatment compared to the others. Um, so this, this was exciting to see that the leaf and the stem mask were actually reduced. If we look at root mass here, we see a similar trend, however, it is comparable to our pH 4.0 treatments, but uh, it, the pH 5.5 treatment, again, is significantly reduced. Um, so this was quite exciting. So I think what we can take away from this, um, oh, and then just to note as well, the, the pythium infection or the disease symptomology was confirmed to be pythium. Uh, after evaluation and analysis, we did you know, check under a microscope and confirm that uh, old spores were present and that it was, was in fact a pythium infection that was causing this disease symptomology. Um, but I think what we can conclude here from this is that pH 4.0 can suppress Pythium afanidimatrum rubat severity after zoospore inoculation without influencing basal plant growth. So this study was performed with a zoospore inoculation. If you think back to the start of this experiment, I mentioned that oospores contain a cell wall and the mycelia of Pythium also contain a cell wall too. So the oospores and mycelia have pit of Pythium have been shown to be less sensitive to low pH stress so it would be interesting to see if these results could be replicated if inoculated with an old spore or mycelia. My thought is that you, could, you would likely be able to experience an infection of Pythium at a pH of 4.0 via an old spore. So even though uh, uh, we, we screen from this that the zoospore inoculation can suppress Pythium infection, you still may experience a Pythium infection, infection excuse me, at a pH of 4.0 via an old spore. However, the old spore may be the primary infection propagule and may be able to establish an infection at pH 4.0, but we see from this study that the zoospores are clearly negatively affected by this low, low pH, and the zoospores are the primary dispersal propagule. So even if an infection is established by an old spore at a pH of 4.0, the dispersal and the spread of pythium should be greatly reduced at a pH of 4.0. So just to reiterate there, the old spore of, my, of pythium is likely less sensitive to low pH stress. So it's likely that an old spore would be able to establish an infection at a pH of 4.0, but this is less of a concern as the zoospore spore is the primary dispersal propagule. So at a pH of 4.0, the zoospore spore dispersal should be greatly reduced. So it'd be interesting to look at, uh, or a follow-up to this study would uh, be to, can these results be replicated with other pythium species? So we saw from our pH studies that uh, plant species are very specific response, or the, the response to pH is very species specific, right? We saw that from the pH studies. So it'd be interesting to see how other pythium species respond to low pH as well, to see if they, they show uh, if it's species specific, like we saw with plants, or if, um, it's just kind of more generalized. So now that we see that pH 4.0 can suppress pythium afanidimate from root rot without influencing basal plant growth, what is the application of this? So the utility of low pH for pythium disease management will really depend on plant pythium species specific responses to low pH. So we saw with basal, it can tolerate this continuous exposure to low pH. So it does seem to be a very effective management strategy uh, for for crops that can tolerate this continuous exposure to low pH. And for crops that can tolerate this continuous exposure to low pH, it is a very low cost and sustainable management strategy. 
So based on the cost for a three week basil cropping cycle, which is the typical time it takes for basil to get to the first cut or the first harvest, we see that the additional cost to lower pH from 5.5 to 4.0 is extremely minimal. And this is based on the cost that we use for sulfuric acid and based on the Hallett Hall greenhouse water quality. Um, but even so, it's so minimal there that you could uh, make the assumption that even with uh, water with more alkalinity and more buffer capacity, that it would still be a very, very minimal cost to lower your pH from 5.5 to 4.0. And then if we look at that comparatively to oxidate, which is typically used uh, as an antiseptic or just as a preventative for lots of different root diseases or hydroponic production in general. Um, so oxidates of hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid uh, mix we can see that it's considerably less expensive, or the oxidate is considerably more expensive, excuse me, than sulfuric acid. And then root shield is another bio, bio control type agent that's typically used for in hydroponic systems. And again, we see that the sulfuric acid is considerably cheaper than uh, both of these commonly employed uh, disease management or antiseptic management. We also saw that this strategy did not drastically change the taste of basil. So this was a question I got a lot. Um, so we always did taste the basil at harvest. Um, and again, this is very subjective, you know, uh, but I, I found that there was no drastic differences in taste. We did observe very minor differences, but I, I, one didn't taste bad compared to the other. So in my mind, it would have in no way affect the marketability of your product by growing at a lower pH. Um, another thing I noticed throughout this research is I experienced less pH fluctuations at a pH of 4.0. Um, so this is just a secondary advantage as a grower has to maintain their pH less at a pH of 4.0. Um, and I believe this is due to the alkalinity being consumed at the low pH, so there's decreased tendency for the pH to neutralize. And then also at a pH of 4.0, there's such a, a large concentration of hydronium ions that the extrusion of OH minus ions to the plant roots just has such a minimal effect. So I think that's why we saw less fluctuations. But again, that's just something as a grower, that's just a secondary advantage. They have to maintain the pH a little bit less. Um, some other applications that I think would be interesting to look into to maybe make this strategy more applicable to crops that cannot tolerate continuous exposure low pH would be a low pH disinfection type system. So many hydroponic systems employ some type of recirculation. So it would be interesting to see if uh, before recirculating the nutrient solution to your plants, maybe if you shock it with a low pH, does that, is that effective in decreasing zoospore populations in the nutrient solution? Um, it would need to be determined how long uh, the pH would need to be lowered and to what pH it would need to be lowered. But that's just, it would be an interesting strategy to investigate to make this strategy more applicable to again, crops that cannot tolerate continuous exposure to low pH. Another strategy would be uh, short-term pH drop. So uh, maybe some crops can't tolerate continuous exposure, but can tolerate a couple days or maybe a week of low pH. Uh, so it'd be interesting to determine, is that effective in decreasing zoospore populations in the nutrient solution? So again, those two applications are just kind of uh, to make this strategy more applicable to uh, crops that cannot tolerate continuous exposure to low pH. So to wrap everything up here, just to conclude um, and take, and take uh, the key takeaways here. So we saw that basal plant growth was not significantly affected by a pH of 4.0 to 5.5, whereas spinach plant growth was significantly reduced in pH below 5.0. Uh, basal seemingly low nutrient requirement is likely responsible for its tolerance to acidity. Um, and the spinach reduction in growth at a pH of 4.5 may be mitigated by further precautionary steps to account for, crease, or for, to account for increased cation antagonism at pH decreases. We learned that the pH dependent factors that are affecting nutrient uptake and nutrient availability in liquid culture hydroponic systems is much different than those found in uh, substrate or soil culture. Soil, soil based systems. The main takeaway here is that we saw that a pH of 4.0 can suppress Pythium athanogenatrum rootbot severity after a zoospore inoculation without influencing basal plant growth. So, before I wrap up here, um, I just want to thank my advisor, Dr. Sherry Kubota. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this lab. And I couldn't have asked for a better advisor throughout all of this. It's just been my pleasure working for you. Um, my committee members, Dr. Michelle Jones and Dr. Sally Miller, thank you guys so much for all your help and uh, support throughout this project. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge all the Kubota lab members. 
Um, Dr. Rotundo and Emil Carr of Dr. Miller's lab, who have been extremely helpful with this Pythium work, helping me isolate the Pythium strains, um, helping with the zoospore and inoculation production. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Hand and her lab members, Isabel and Corley. Thank you for allowing me to use your lab space. Um, always taking the time to answer any of my questions and teach me proper lab techniques with the Pythium work. Um, so they, they've been extremely helpful. And then also just the Ohio State Department of Horticulture and Crop Science, Dr. Metzger, Jim Vent, and the whole Howlett Hall greenhouse staff. Um, Andy Evans, thank you for always sending my water and tissue samples for me. Um, Regina and Vivian and just all the faculty in the HCS department. Uh, I think it's a really great group and very grateful for the opportunity to be a part of it. Um, so with that, thank you all for being here and thank you for your attention. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions.